Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In a previous interview with Dr. Jonathan Stapley, we talked about his book, In the Power of Godliness, and we got Jonathan's take on whether women healed by power of priesthood in the early days of the church. So I'll have uh, Margaret respond to some of Jonathan's uh, comments there. And we're going to continue our series on the Gospel Topics series book. If you don't have this book, you really need to get it. Um, edited by Matthew Harris and Newell Bringhurst. And Margaret has a chapter in there, as well as Thomas Murphy from our previous interviews. So um, you won't want to miss it. But anyway, back to our conversation. Well, one of the things that I remember, because uh, I talked to Jonathan uh, here on Gospel Tangents, and I might even... If, if I'm technically savvy, put put that little clip in there. But the exchange that I remember um, having was Jonathan said, because I, I remember restating what, what I thought his position was, and so I'm, I'm curious to have you comment on this. A lot of times we use priesthood, uh, a definition of priesthood is the power to act in the name of God. And a lot of the women in the 1800s, when they gave priesthood, ble- when they gave blessings, I shouldn't say priesthood, when they gave blessings, used did so in as as the power to act in the name of God. But he says to equate what they did in the 1800s with our modern conceptions of priesthood is incorrect. And, and I remember saying, God, this is really hard for me to understand. <laughs> and he, and he, he kind of agreed with that. But to me, it seems kind of, I don't know, I... I I, I'm a math guy, as we've mentioned. A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. It's the transitive property. Um, and so he says, well, essentially, as a mathematical say, he says the transitive property does not apply in this situation. So, so um, let me read you a couple of statements. So in my essay, one of the things I do, I examine the language of Joseph Smith in those Nauvoo Relief Society minutes, which in fact, I, I actually, my first, piece I ever wrote on women in priesthood in 1984, my central argument was about the the Relief Society lectures of Joseph Smith. And although those were not made available to most people, or most people didn't know about them until the internet, because of a book by Andy E. Hatt and Lyndon Cook, The Words of Joseph Smith, I discovered that those in 1981. And that was why I wrote this first essay. And um, so you know, those speeches are really important, but then you have the problem of, you know, the church essay saying, oh, Joseph Smith didn't mean, and here we're back to Jonathan too, what did Joseph Smith mean by that? So I spent a long time on my essay bringing in other statements of Joseph Smith to show why I think that he really meant priesthood in this larger sense. Now, whether or not that gave women the authority to act in the church is a harder and, and, and more interesting question. But then I bring in several statements by Bathsheba Smith and Sarah Kimball to show how, and this was, the, this happened, these statements, they start in the Woman's Exponent, which was kind of the predecessor of the Relief Society magazine, where in 1892, when they had the jubilee of the celebration of the founding of the Relief Society in Nauvoo, the Sarah Kimball went back and reviewed the notes and the minutes. So I want to read a couple of statements to you, but to me, it's really important to see what did Eliza R. Snow, what did Bathsheba Smith, what did Sarah Kimball think that Joseph Smith meant by that? They were there. It doesn't mean that they had perfect understanding. I mean, we can be in the same room and totally misunderstand each other, right? But they had a sense of what jo- what they saw them. And this goes back to Eliza Arsenal carrying those minutes around. They talked about the promises that Joseph gave us. And I think that for them, this was extremely important. So if I can find it here in my essay, I'll read a couple of these. <clears throat> Um, So, um, in the summer of 1905, Bathsheba Smith reviewed the original um, 
Nauvoo Relief Society minutes as the society's current president. So she was pre the Relief Society president in 1905. And she also presided over women's temple work, by the way. The Relief Society president used to do that. And she reported in, this is her quote from the woman's exponent. Joseph said he wanted to make us, as the women were in Paul's day, a kingdom of priestesses. She calls it priestesses. We have the ceremony in our endowment as Joseph taught. And then she goes on and declares that Joseph Smith had told the women in Avu that the purpose of the founding of the Relief Society was to make complete the organization of the church by organizing the women in the order of the priesthood. I mean, that to me is phenomenal. And she also quotes, again, Sarah Kimball re reviewed those, those minutes in 1892 and said the same thing. They said um, that Joseph had organized them in the order of the priesthood and that they were, you know, fulfilling. Another statement that Bathsheba Smith meant, which was what she said, and I'll see if I can find that one. It's also very important. And if I can't right here, she says that when he organized them and gave them the endowment, that he also gave them the authority to give blessings. So Bathsheba Smith, at least, and some of the other women like Eliza R. Snow saw that it was that the, um, oh, here it is. Another statement by Bathsheba Smith, who was there. Joseph gave us everything, every order of the priesthood and instructions that they could administer to the sick. So they connected the administering to the sick with their priesthood that they received in the temple. Now, it's interesting. The essay quotes Eliza Snow by saying, you know, oh, you know, you can, you can heal in the name of Jesus. Don't do it with the priesthood. But again, here's my critique of the essay. They don't mention that Eliza Snow said that to women who weren't endowed. And, and Joseph, actually, this is what he says in Nauvoo, that just by your baptism, you have the power to heal. And then he says to them, but I'm going to soon give you something more that will give you even more power and authority to heal and use the, the spiritual gifts. And, and that's, what, that's what Bathsheba said. You know, what Joseph gave us, he gave us all of these orders of the priesthood that give us this power to heal and to lay our hands on the sick. And so Eliza, yeah, she said, you can, you can heal the sick just with the power of Jesus. But if you're an endowed woman, you can use the Melchizedek priesthood. So I, 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 I kind of both agree and disagree with Jonathan. I think it's true that Joseph Smith's view and the 19th century views are different than what we see today. But I also think that there is evidence that in the 19th century that the women and the, I think just the Relief Society minutes show that Joseph Smith really did believe that he was giving women the priesthood and that he felt like the Relief Society should be an organization of women's priesthood. I, I think that there's quite a bit of evidence to show that. And again, I, I think that the big difference between, and it's funny, I said this in my 1984 essay, I think today in the church, when we talk about it's the power of God, we think about the organization. It's the power of God where you can, you know, have an office in the church or have a calling in the church or, you know, whatever. But we don't see it as, we, and even though obviously we acknowledge that you have to have spiritual power, I don't think we see it as this necessary power that is part of the process of sanctification. So, and at, the more I studied Joseph Smith's statements about priesthood, I became convinced that for him, priesthood was kind of on this series of ordinances, and that the ordinances are both a conduit to connecting to spiritual power, but they're also an outward expression of what should be happening in the interior for us. So, I mean, even if you think about the whole idea of the power of godliness, the power of godliness, it's the power to make you godly. <laughs> I think that's partly what it means. 
So, you know, we kind of focus on the church ecclesiastical function. I think Joseph Smith was more concerned with the spiritual cosmological aspect of it. So even though Joseph Smith didn't use the term cosmological, he used, again, messi- the fullness of the, of the Melchizedek, the priesthood of Elijah, the messianic priesthood. Those were terms that Joseph Smith used, and he connects that. He used the term the fullness of the priesthood, that you have this full power of the priesthood to bring you into the presence of God, which, of course, the temple does symbolically. It represents that journey of the soul from the pre-mortal world to go back to God, and that I, I see the endowment of priesthood as being part of that. And I want to say one more thing about this. I think for Joseph Smith, he saw the fullness of the priesthood as residing in individuals. That when you were given priesthood, God plants his power in you. Whereas I think in the church, we think of priesthood as the power residing in the institution. And then the institution can grant you power to act within the church structure. But I think Joseph Smith saw priesthood, it was an endowment of power. And that was, I mean, it's called an endowment, right? You're endowed with power and it's internal. Now, obviously you cannot act, you know, you can't like ordain yourself to be an elder or you can't say, I know I'm really called to be the bishop, right? But again, that's an ecclesiastical thing. But I think from Joseph Smith's perspective that that spiritual power was the center and that was the most important part of it. So. Well, that's interesting because I think and I I think the issue, especially when I was talking with Jonathan, but I think with the essay as well is in modern times, we we have kind of conflated priesthood with priesthood office and. And I know Jonathan's point, and I think the essay's point too, as well, is women were not ordained teachers, priests, deacons, elders, high priests, etc. And I think everybody everybody can get on board with that. And the problem is, this definition of priesthood, today we create priesthood with priesthood office, but that's not necessarily how Joseph viewed priesthood. And no, I don't so think he did. when we say that women have priests, or even Joseph Smith, when women have priesthood via the endowment, or even, you said earlier, baptism, which that kind of surprised me when you said that. Um, we're, that, that use of the word is completely separate from priesthood office. And so is that the issue is that modern people equate priesthood with priesthood office rather than spiritual power? I mean, is, is that a way to view this issue? Well, I think that that's part of the problem, but I think it's more complicated than that in the sense that, again, if you go back to these women, Eliza Snow, Bathsheba Smith, Sarah Kimball, um, you know, people called um, Eliza Snow the, a high priestess. And I think that that those women really did think that the Relief Society, which was a church organization, it's not as though they saw it as a separate organization or wasn't part of the church, but I think that they saw their roles in the Relief Society as a kind of church function. Now, again, that didn't make them elders in the church, right? So that's one issue. I I do think that in those 19th century women saw more of an overlap than we ever would, right? Right. So I, I think there's that part of it. An overlap with priesthood office? Is that what you're saying? An overlap with endowment, the temple endowment, and how you can how you how you can use priesthood in the church. So even back to blessings. Priesthood I as think in that, priesthood power, right? Yeah. But I, I so two things. I think those 19th century women saw both that gave them priesthood power, which they could use them. They thought they could use the Melchizedek priesthood to give a blessing. But also, I think they saw it as that the Relief Society was a the women's priesthood organization. You know, and I'm not sure that everybody saw that, but I think there were some central women who really believed that and that that was very important to them. But then there's the larger question, which is, um, 
and, and this for me is a really important one, where if you actually receive in the temple the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood, is that a justification that God wanted to include women in the ecclesiastical priesthood as well? And I think here's where Jonathan and I disagree. He thinks no, right? But I think that for Joseph Smith, and this is so central to how I see how he thought, and it's in DNC 121, where he says the rights of the priesthood and the power of the priesthood are inseparably connected. And we always, and I agree with the interpretation that it says what? If you misuse your priesthood, then amen, because you won't have the power of godliness, right? Even if you may still have an office, but if you misuse it, the, the power of godliness departs from you. By the way, it doesn't mean that if you that your ordinances you do that, like if you um, if you were a bishop and you ordained somebody, but you were really secretly sinning and doing all these things. Well, you've lost your spiritual power, but that does not negate what you've done officially in your office. Hmm. There been at, there were there were debates about that in the early twentieth century. You know, if somebody we find out is, you know, a bishop is wicked, does it mean that we have to go back and redo all the ordinances that he did? And they said no, because God can work through it. But still, he lost his spiritual power, right? So there's that. But um, but on the other hand, you could say, um, so what I said before, if you have, because Joseph, I think, I was doing 121. I got myself, I digressed a little bit. But if you have the rights and the power connected, and, you, and I think they're not supposed to be separate. And I think this is one of Joseph's great theological gifts. The spiritual and the physical should be intertwined. That, you know, we should have a, a Zion society that reflects a holy people who are living according to the commandments of God. And it's, yeah, we should all be in, in, in the interior. We should be spiritual beings, but we should manifest it in outward works. So on the one hand, you could say, well, amen to the priest of the man, you know, the, if, you're, if, you, if you abuse your power, then you don't have the power of godliness. But you could go the other direction and say, if you have the power of godliness, if you have the fullness of the priesthood through the temple, does that give you a right to function in the church? Now, it doesn't automatically give you the authority because the authority has to come from the priesthood channels. But if, if I say, well, I have the fullness of the priesthood, should I be able to do that? And, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but I think in the temple ceremony, it says that if you have the robe of the Melchizedek, robes of the Melchizedek priesthood on you in a certain way, you're ready to officiate in all of the ordinances of the gospel. Now you could say, oh, they just mean the temple ordinances, but that's not the wording. And again, I mean, maybe we'll have time, Rick. I have like six things I bring up that Joseph Smith did and said that I think, you know, support my argument or my interpretation. But what really it brings up the question with is if you believe that Joseph Smith, you know, was inspired to, you know, as he, as he revealed things at the beginning of this dispensation, are there things that we haven't really done yet that maybe we should do? Now, I know, again, it has to come through the prophet, but I'm one who believes that you can kind of ask questions and prod. So, for example, and this was really central to my argument, is the issue of what was the purpose of the mission of Elijah? We now see Elijah as having come to reveal the sealing ordinances of the temple. But if you look at the statements, and I have like four I could read you. I don't know if I have time for all of them, but I'll start with one. And that I think Joseph Smith saw Elijah as restoring the fullness of the priesthood. So that, he, and so here's a quote from Joseph Smith. And it's great that we have these available on the Joseph Smith papers now. He said this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, which was one of his favorite phrases, the dispensation of the fullness of times will bring to light the things that have been revealed in all former dispensations, also other things that have not been before revealed. 
he shall send Elijah the prophet and restore all things in Christ. There's another statement where he says, the church was not organized in its proper order until Elijah came. And, and I really think that he felt like that, and, and I could give you a couple more statements where he talks about Elijah bringing the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood, which had all the keys necessary to get the church in the right order. And I think one of those was to acknowledge the priesthood power of women. I mean, and, and you know, maybe this is Margaret's interpretation, but I do think I have backing of statements by Joseph Smith that I think he felt that until the, until women could function in priesthood along with men, and you know, I'm not saying I know exactly how that should look, but he felt that until that happens, we did not have the fullness of the priesthood. We did not have the fullness of how the church should be organized. And that, that, and, and that was part of God's design that the women would also meet, move according to the, to the order of the ancient priesthood along with men. And to me, when I look at the Nauvoo Relief Society minutes, I think Joseph Smith says it very clearly. Um, and if you connect that with his other statements about the mission of Elijah, um, other statements about what the fullness of the priesthood is, that I think it's really clear. I think he had a broader vision of it, um, which is not to say that everything we have now is wrong. I'm certainly not arguing that, Rick. I'm just saying that if I look at Joseph Smith and what I see as kind of his vision of the fullness of the priesthood and a Zion society, I think that it's more expansive than what we have now in the church. So I, I think it, it says there are other possibilities. And, you know, it's really interesting. I, in, in that first speech I gave on women and priesthood in 1984, where I was so influenced by Joseph Smith's statements to the Nauvoo Relief Society, he says to the women, he kind of says, be patient and endure in love. And God will say eventually to you, come up higher. And I closed that essay I wrote with that because I guess that, you know, my spiritual feelings were that, you know, I think that I, I when, when after I read so much about Joseph Smith, I saw a vision of how priesthood could function that for me was more expansive than what we have now. And certainly was not meant to, you know, just say, oh, let's just bring in all the equal rights of the secular community into the, into the church. But it was more, you know, if we open our minds, what else might God have to reveal to us? I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano. In our next conversation, Margaret will ask some questions that she will answer in our next episode. Is the church a mechanism for individual empowerment or is the church the thing that we all have to just serve? Are we subordinate to the church or is the church here to serve us? If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just click the yellow subscribe button, and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.